Okay, so I thought I was uh, finished with Ted Bundy, but um, I'm going to do this final one, this final video in this series on the disappearance of Ann Burr, just because I'm intrigued by it. Okay, so Ann Burr disappeared on August 30th, 1961. Her body has never been found. She was eight years old. This was from Tacoma, Washington. Ted's uh, eventual stomping grounds. He lived there. Uh, his mom moved him there when he was younger. And in fact, on August 30th, 1961, Ted Bundy was 14 years of age. Now, you'll want to say to yourself, at age 14, is Ted Bundy capable of killing? The simple answer to that is yes. Now, what do we know about Bundy at this time? Well, we know he was into voyeurism. He was a peeping Tom. He did roam the neighborhoods. And this is according to Bundy himself. Now, eventually, he'll contradict that, but he does that in everything. He was a burglar, he was a thief, he was working his way up to the Ted Bundy serial killer that we all know. He certainly was not there yet at age 14, but it doesn't mean that he, he couldn't be responsible for this, right? So there's two camps, just like everything in life. Camp that sees it one way, camp that sees it another. Where am I on this? Well, you give it its due diligence. Is it possible is it probable certainly possible um, the reason I say this is when you look at the Amber abduction okay she's sleeping in a room with other siblings her mom gets up at 5 30 in the morning checks on the kids not there when they go downstairs and look the living room window is open the front door is ajar and the previous night, that window had been shut down, but not locked, and it wasn't all the way down. They left it a little bit open, easy entrance uh, for a possible burglar or planned abduction. The door, front door, was chained and locked shut. However, discovered in the morning, the latch is undone, and the door is unlocked, and it's open. Easy to determine what happened there person, suspect, offender, entered living room through open window, abducts girl, takes her out. The easiest egress there is, the front door. That's important in all cases. I see this with uh, Elizabeth Smart case. I've seen it with uh, like even John Benet Ramsey case. You think about it. You, you want to, once you enter a home, Okay, entering it is the hard part. The offender has to figure out how can I enter it without being detected. Doesn't really matter how difficult it is as long as I get in undetected. Now when you leave, especially when you're leaving with a body, alive or dead, unconscious, doesn't matter, you want to take the most efficient and fastest route and easiest route you can take which is always the front or the back door very rarely they'll go out the same way that they came in when they have a body now if it's just a burglar sure you came in that way very easy to go out that way but in this case very easy to determine what happened in the window out the front door <sighs> evidence okay what evidence is in this case that can link any offender not just Ted Bundy Ted Bundy wasn't even a suspect in this in 1961 a next-door neighbor was now why well the evidence the offender took a, a bench that was near or around the house area 
maybe the garden area, and moved it to the window that was open. There was a footprint in the ground and I believe on top of that bench. That's how they went in. Now that footprint is very important. It is measured size six to seven. As you can see by this chart here that I looked up, that is typical for a teenage boy. Who does that fit? That's right, Ted Bundy. But Ted Bundy isn't the only teenager that lives in the area. You can't pin every murder on Ted Bundy. Although he's good for a lot of them, there's no doubt. You have to de dive deeper into Ted Bundy's psyche at the time and the evidence and see if it fits. So you have the shoe print as evidence. There was a red thread that was caught in the window jam, believed to be that of the offender. That doesn't get you very far. It's a red thread. It's something. It's better than a lot of cases have, but that's not going to link you to Ted Bundy. Now, Ted Bundy grew up, from what I researched, five blocks away from where Amber was abducted. I like that in the aspect of when a serial killer first murders. It is usually an acquaintance, someone they kind of know, and it's in their comfort zone. In their comfort zone, meaning I can kill, I, I really don't want it right next door to me, but a few blocks away, I will do. Um, and why? Because you're comfortable in that area. You know it. Ted Bundy, in this case, he knows that area. Okay, he's walked it at night. He's a newspaper delivery person. Did not deliver specifically to Ann Burr and her family, but in that general area. If you're going to commit a crime, homicide in this case, you want to be far enough away from your house that it doesn't really link you, but close enough to home that you can get there quickly. Does that make sense? So this fits Ted Bundy to me without a doubt. Now, as far as I've researched, and I've talked about this in earlier incidents with Bundy, how you don't just start off murdering, okay? To these power control killers, and, and that's a term that I got when uh, Richard Walter sent me. And Richard Walter, if you don't know, he, he, he was a good influence in, in my development uh, to get where I'm going. Now, I only met the man personally, I think, like three or four times. I've gone to his house, went to lunch with him. He came to um, my place of employment, the district attorney's office, and talked with the district attorney and myself uh, about a case. Um, I also went to a VDOC Society conference with him. Um, but he gave me uh, a, a paper, and I believe it might have been for the Academy of Forensic Science, but I'm not sure. But it was something he wrote with Bob Keppel and power control, power assertive, anger retaliatory, all different types of killers. Now, this sometimes agreed with the FBI's classification manual, sometimes it didn't. But that's okay. I mean, who's to say one's better than the other? Some will, some won't. I won't. I like them both. I think they're interchangeable, and I like to throw my own uh, spin on those as well. But I forget absolutely where I was going with that about power control killing. Um, but he didn't. He people don't just start with that. They progress. They don't start with murder. It's peeping tom. It's fantasy, voyeurism, uh, magazines, pornography, in Bundy's case. Although, what he says about pornography, you know, I don't truly buy. 
there's millions of men out there who look at pornography and they're not serial killers. So him blaming everything on pornography, eh, I'm not buying it. I'm sure it had an effect, but not to the point where he ended up doing what he did to all these victims. So we have a 14-year-old Bundy. We have a shoe print, size 6 or 7, which is, to me, a teenager. It could be a small adult, sure, but eh, that's mostly teenage shoe from what I researched. That same print was also found by a basement window. So what does that tell you? Eh, it basically tells you that they were looking for a way in. Okay. Now, neighbors of the Burrs had seen somebody peeping in their windows only days previous to this. Who's that match? Match is Ted Bundy for sure. Was Ted Bundy the only peeping Tom in the neighborhood? I doubt it. But remember, we've deduced this in my mind from a big pool of suspects to teenagers that are male. So it whittles it down a lot. Bundy is now still in that grouping. It reminds me kind of a little bit about Bundy's first two victims. Karen Sparks, who survived, and Linda Healy, uh, who he abducted from the house. But could a 14-year-old do this to an 8-year-old girl? Yes. Now, you'll have critics that will say, if a stranger came into the house... At 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock a.m., the, remember the dog, according to the parents, did bark, but they just thought it was because of a storm coming through. Um, that the victim, and Burr in this case, would scream and yell. That's a myth, folks. That's a myth that people have got to get out of their head, okay? When a stranger breaks into a home, and puts a gun or a knife to your throat and says make a noise and I will cut your throat test me you are not going to scream or they say make a noise and I take this knife and I plunge it into your sleeping sister's chest and then I'll do the same thing to your mom and dad and your dog you're not going to scream how else do you think they gain control of these victims? Okay, so think of Elizabeth Smart. Stranger abduction. She didn't scream. Okay, so it happens all the time. Please get rid of that fallacy that a child will scream. Now, one of the things that I had a hard time with thinking that this wasn't Bundy, okay? I'm trying to convince myself that I don't think it was him. And what steered me away from that is that I believe Bundy's or most serial killers, and I don't know if this is backed up by research or not. So I have a hard time saying it, but I'm going to say it as a and a gut feeling and opinion of mine is that their first victim is usually younger or weaker. And I think it depends on the on the serial killer it's themselves. And what I mean by that is if it's if it's fantasy driven, they have a fantasy in their mind. It might, their fantasy might not be an 8-year-old girl. It might be a 23-year-old, long, brown-haired, parted-in-the-middle type of person. Yet, they are scared to implement that fantasy. Why? Because the fantasy could go awry. They could get overpowered. Bundy, in, what, 1969, at age 23, we know that he, he tried 
to do harm to a couple of victims. One, he entered their home, tried to smother the girl with the pillow. She began to scream. He ran away. That fantasy was thwarted. Again, he took a tree branch when he was drunk, I think, and tried to hit somebody over the head as they were getting in their car and they ran away. So the fantasy is thwarted. But when we look at those victims, and I call them victims even though they survived, uh, Bundy at age 23 when he tried to suffocate one with a pillow and tried to beat the other ones with a, a branch, they were, they were older victims. By older, I mean they weren't kids. So his fantasy, to me, did not involve children. That's not what got him off. Yet, when you start killing, who better to start with than the weak, the young, who cannot thwart your fantasy? It may not be the perfect fantasy, but it's a good place to start in the serial killer's mind. So for those reasons, I think Ted Bundy could very well be capable and be a suspect in this murder. Now when Bundy was asked about this, these murders by various people that interviewed him at uh, various points of time when he was in jail, right up to the time where he was getting executed, uh, he said, and I'm going to quote what he said here, he's, at different times he's denied this. He's denied that he had any involvement in this abduction. But he also said that there were some cases that he would never talk about because one, they were too close to home. That matches Ann Burr. Two, they were too close to family. That matches Ann Burr. Three, the victims were too young. That matches Ann Burr. It also matches Kimberly Leach and why he wouldn't talk about her because she was 12. But yet, but yet, he confessed to what Lynn Culver, Lynette Culver, who was age 12. And he didn't have to. He wasn't even a suspect in that murder. But before he was executed, he confessed to that. So, there were some other coincidences that may or may not be true. I believe they've been proved to be true. Bundy's uncle lived near, no, I mean Bundy lived near five blocks, but his uncle lived even closer to Amber's residence. Um, some people, I think Ann Rule, who wrote the book, The Stranger Beside Me, said that Bundy actually knew Ann Burr, but I don't, I've never seen any evidence of that. Now, Amber's parents actually wrote Bundy in prison and asked him, you know, your appeals are denied, you're going to die, please tell us what you did to Ann. And he denied it. He, and I'll show the letter here that he wrote back to the Burrs. But Do I believe him? It's hard to believe anything Bundy said. But in the book that I had talked, that I read, that was sent to me, um, The Only Living Witness, he gave a hypothetical, I think, in that. Or maybe it was a different book. I'm, I, I'm not sure where he said that in talking in third person, he killed a girl... A young girl in an orchard there happened to be an orchard you know close to Amber and also Amber's father had said he saw a teenage Ted Bundy that morning kicking dirt in a ditch and he believed that that's where she was buried you know how I feel about eyewitness testimony especially years later um, but 
I, it's certainly possible. Is it probable? Well, there was an incident that took place many years later when Ted Bundy was living with his girlfriend Liz and their, I guess you could say his stepdaughter even though they, they weren't married, Liz's daughter. I believe her name was Molly. When Molly was seven years old, Bundy was playing hide and seek with her when her mom was out. She went looking for him and she found him under a blue Afghan blanket and he was naked. He said that hey he wanted he could be invisible that's why he had to take off his clothes another ruse. Um, he got into bed with her naked and was reading her a bedtime story. He had an erection. She didn't know what that really was at the age of seven, but the next thing she knew, her bed was wet. And she made mention of that to Ted, saying, you peed the bed. So it's obviously, you know, he ejaculated. Now you're sitting there saying, oh, that's sick. And it is. But get beyond that, and what does it tell you? Well, it tells me he can control himself, right? He did not rape the seven-year-old girl. He could have. He could have killed her if that was his fantasy, right? But it, it, it's not. Maybe his... I'm not going to say proclivity to young girls... Um, obviously something's not right. You get an erection around a seven-year-old girl, <laughs> you know, you have problems. And, and clearly he did. But it wasn't the fantasy that he wanted or couldn't control because he would have sexually assaulted and killed her. And some people will say, well, no, he wouldn't. He wouldn't get away. Well, why not? Why not? Would he have immediately been a suspect? Trust me, in Ted Bundy's mind, he could get out of anything. Hey, she walked to the store. She disappeared. I don't know what you're talking about. It'd be as simple as that. But he was able to control any urge that he had with her. And he, he didn't assault her. Which means, to me, he did not have a proclivity to young girls. So, I guess, what do I believe? I mean, I think that it's possible that Bundy could have been involved in this. I do not believe that it's probable. Now, the, your best piece of evidence, obviously, is the shoe. Just like the Zodiac, with that wing walker shoe. That's Zodiac's print, okay? If a suspect doesn't match that shoe size, move on. Don't try to make it fit. Well, he wore larger shoes because he knew he'd leave that print. No, it's bullshit, okay? Don't try to make it fit. Move on. If Bundy had a size 6 or 7 at that time, he's certainly a suspect. But so should every other person that had that size because that's the only piece of evidence you have and it's good evidence now there was a teenage neighbor and I forget what his name was when I researched it and it doesn't matter but he was known to have some sort of unique friendship with Anne and she he had failed to polygraph the first time passed it the second time but um, he certainly should be looked at, and I believe he probably was, as should every teenager within five block radius. They should be looked at. Anybody that has that size shoe. It's very easy to start deducing. You start with your best evidence, and you work your way from there. I don't, I don't believe that Ted Bundy was involved in this. 
I just don't see him. I don't see that he has proclivities at that time for younger girls. Yet, yet, there is some evidence that suggests that, you know, his statement that the victims were too young. Now, I have a problem with that statement. And the problem is the plural use of victims. He should have said victim was too young. He says victims, which means there were more than one young victim. Now, I wouldn't say 100%, you know, that I believe Bundy was not involved in this. I think there's a possibility, just not a probability. He would have to have stopped killing. Let's say he abducted Anne. And then he doesn't kill again until 1973, 74. From 1961 to 73, he goes dormant. That's a long time to have no other victims. Now, it's possible she could have been the first where he, okay, you know, yeah, and was so put off by it that he doesn't do it again. But that's a long, that's a long time. Uh, to suppress those urges and I just don't believe that he could have done that there would have been more victims in that in that realm from 61 to 73 for sure I still believe he was just in the peeping Tom burglary phase of his life and it didn't progress to murder yet that's my belief on this case I'm going to look over my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything that I want to tell you. Um, the evidence, size 6 shoe imprint, red thread. The person not being scared of the dog. I think that was important as well. Um, sometimes you hear a dog bark, you're gone. But this person didn't. And they took her out of that house. Now people will say it had to be familiar with the house. Again, that's another fallacy, okay? You can tell by a house, especially if you're a peeping Tom and you've already looked at it, you know bedrooms are upstairs, okay? It's not hard once you enter a house to find a staircase to go up to a bedroom, okay? So the person does not have to be familiar with the house. But they weren't scared of the dog. Um... I guess it depends on what type of dog it was. But this person that entered that house was obviously very brazen. Um, but you cannot say, and you're a fool if you do, that the offender knew the victim. There's no evidence of that. I think I covered all my notes, everything that I can. So the bottom line is, I do not feel that Ted Bundy was involved in this murder. Yet, I would not rule it out 1,000%. I put nothing past Bundy. He is a liar, was a liar. He was a manipulator. Um, he was a con man. Much like Charles Manson. I believe, not in the killing aspect, obviously, but as in a con man. He could say what you wanted to hear to make you trust him. That was Manson. Um, and it's funny, as I've seen something, an interview they did with Manson, he asked him about Bundy, and he went off on this unintelligible, uh, calling him a mama's boy and this and that. Uh, pretty comical, but... That is it. Final finute on Ted Bundy. Okay. I spent like two or three weeks on this guy. For good reason. You can learn so much from him. And I did. I learned a lot. Very fascinating individual. 
and um, hey, there's more there's more victims than we know about. I'm not saying hundreds. Um, you know, might only be a handful. You know, five, four, but they're there, and Bundy's responsible for them. Bad individual, this guy. One of the most unique serial killers. And some people have said, you know, you say he's a perfect guy. He was sloppy. He was this and that. Um, there's some credence to that. But he got away with it, didn't he? For a long time. And he's still gotten away with some that we don't know about. So to me, he was a perfect killing machine. And for his his vocation and I keep saying that word vocation that was his line of work his vocation was serial killing murder mayhem that's what he did and he was good at it his trial he would not have been convicted if that trial happened today hardly have any evidence against him. Sometimes I think back and I think, how did we convict anybody in the annals of history without DNA? Because nowadays, that's what you need. You need DNA. And even then, it's like, oh, it was planted. But back then, fibers, hairs, but we all know how hair evidence works. You know, the FBI is even admitted, and I talked previously about how I had to go back through the district attorney's records when I worked there in order to look at any case that anybody got convicted on FBI's testimony on hair evidence because we had to pull those out and go through them and get rid of some retry some or you know the DA had that call but we had to do that on hair evidence but that's how they convicted people back then Bundy's bite marks was the key piece of evidence odontology is by some a junk science I do not believe that you could have convicted Bundy on those bite marks today was Bundy responsible absolutely yes he killed all those women but today, you would not have convicted him on that evidence. Nope. He would have walked. It's just amazing to me how we were, you're able to gain convictions before DNA. Fingerprints are helpful, but Bunny never left any fingerprints. That's why I say he's, he was good at what he did. Did he get sloppy? Sure. He, was in, he got intoxicated. Um, that happens you know think about you if you get intoxicated you know think of some of the questionable judgment calls that you had at 2 30 in the morning intoxicated leaving a bar okay they weren't the best decisions of your life they could be construed as sloppy so that happens right i got off kilter i was ending the video going back to ending the video Amber, possible but not probable victim of Ted Bundy, August 30th, 1961. My final opinion until I see more evidence. Okay, with that, I'm moving on from Bundy. On to the next one. Don't know what it's going to be. Whatever strikes my fancy, I'm going to get it and I'm going to do it. So until then, hey, Maine's out.